Okay, cool. All right, so this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Estratios Grivas, or, or uh, Stratos, as he's asked me to call him. Um, so for those of y'all who are unfamiliar with Mr. Grivas' body of work, he is an international chess grandmaster, a renowned author, a FIDE international arbiter, tournament organizer, and FIDE senior trainer. So, how's everything going today, Mr. Grievous? Well, I'm glad, okay. I hope you are doing fine also. I am, I am. Okay, well, um, the title of the interview series is How to Become a Grandmaster, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So, when did you learn chess, and uh, who taught you the game? Well, I learned uh, the game quite lately. I was around uh, 13, uh, and I was taught in a chess club by someone uh, that uh, I hardly even remember his name. And uh, from that time I start to really work on uh, the game. I don't say only playing, by, by, because by only playing you can't really become something, uh, something good in any kind of uh, game or even in any profession. Okay, in the start uh, you see the game uh, purely relaxing and having fun, but uh, um, Time by time it became uh, something that uh, I want to prove myself in, so I decided that I have to really work hard on that. On that. Okay, so yeah, I mean, you, you started pretty late. I mean, a lot of guys these days, uh, by the time they're 13, you know, they don't even have a driver's license and they're already a, a grandmaster, already 2700. Um, so, you know, I, given that you started kind of late, I guess you started playing tournaments, you know, how were you doing um, kind of coming into the game a little bit later than, than most people? Well, actually, I had to work more than the others, probably because I had to uh, to cover this uh, chronicle period which I lost by starting uh, lately. So the next three, four years, I worked uh, quite happily, and of course, I became grandmaster uh, on uh, my twenty seventh, which is about uh, let's say something like uh, fourteen, fifteen years after I learned the game, which is quite normal, let's say. Nowadays, of course, becoming a grandmaster has been reduced to something like 10 years of hard labor. But, uh, I mean, 20, 25 years ago, you need around this time of 15 years to become a grandmaster. And why do you think that's changed? I mean, do you think it's technology, the availability of tournaments? Um, you know, what, what do you think, kind of, what's, what's the difference? Well, first of all, uh, being a better player uh, means that uh, you can easily become a better trainer. So there are more there are more good trainers on the market. Let's see, more good trainers around. They can uh, teach the game and uh, create uh, what we call a good player. I don't know if it will be a grandmaster, but generally a good player. Technology is helping very much. We have a lot of material in work nowadays, ready material without very much research. The only problem is that sometimes you have too much material, so you don't know what to do with it. And here comes uh, a trainer. The trainer will really separate what is good and what is bad and will save you time. Time, energy and quality. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so when did you feel like you started making legitimate progress in your game? And, and how did it happen? I mean, can you can you recall a specific turning point, you know, working with a coach or a trainer, or just, you know, you kind of changed how you were approaching studying the game? Well, I was quite lucky that uh, I started, uh, when my early years, I started working with a trainer, which is, I think, a quite familiar name in the USA, Dr. Nikolai Minev. Um, he's living in Seattle and worked with uh, Yasser Seyravan and uh, Joel Benjamin afterwards, as far as I know. So, uh, at that time, when I was around 13, 14, the guy was living in Athens, so he helped me quite a lot to understand how I have to train and how do I have to proceed uh, from my way to the absolute title. So, I believe uh, good training helped me quite a lot in my youth years. At least, at least it compensated my late starting. Okay. And... Um 
how exactly did you become a GM? I mean, did, you know, were there any specific tournaments? Um, I noticed a couple years before, just you know, looking through your biography, you had been working with um, FM Geller. So you know, I thought that was pretty impressive. So, you know, what what exact steps did you take to become a grandmaster, other than you know, working with a few trainers and stuff like that? Well, there are not big secrets. What you have to do is uh, to play a lot of tournaments, to work with good trainers, and to be uh, dedicated to what you are doing. Actually, um, when I was around 18, I was uh, able to attend uh, the Budvin School in Moscow for some time, which helped me a lot because uh, I had uh, good training with uh, very top uh, trainers. And uh, this actually helps you a lot to understand what's going on in the church world and what really is your weak point and how you have to proceed. But everything is going up by tournament, tour, by tournament, step by step, day by day. It's a hard labor. Okay. And, and how much time did you spend in, in Moscow with the Bobbinick School? That was in 1984, is that correct? Yeah, that was in 1984. Well, I didn't spend so much, around one month. But uh, this month was really showing me how I have to work and how I have to do things, which is quite important. You see, it is not so big deal to work many hours in chess. I mean, uh, quantity is not the most important thing, but quality in training and quality in preparation is what really counts. So what I really learned in uh, Moscow is how to put quality on my training and uh, my way to do things. Okay. Um, so. What are your top book recommendations for beginner to intermediate players? Let's say under 2,000 feet. Well, the only one they have to, to think about is uh, <laughs> what they want exactly from the game. They want to have good time, they have to have fun, that's fine for me, no problem, everybody loves that. But if they want really to go to for the very, very top, first of all, they have to be dedicated to what they are doing. It's a hard labor, I'm consistently telling that because I live with this and uh, it's a lot of work you have to learn and learn and learn it's much more easier i would suggest them much more easier to become a lawyer a doctor it will take them less time and it will be more easier but if they want to try to become a grandmaster then uh, nobody first of all is guaranteed that it will succeed and uh, second they have really to work a lot so no secrets working is the only secret <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, so I guess, you know, kind of a related topic. Do you think chess players, or, or specifically, you know, grandmasters, top chess players, are born with a natural ability or a gift, or did they become so talented through hard work in the right environment? I mean, do you think it's, it's just hard work, or, or there's an element of natural talent there as well? No, there's nothing like a natural talent. Actually, I believe that if you ask any top player, if you call him a talented, probably you are insulting him. Because if, if uh, it's only talent what counts, then uh, all his hard work goes to nowhere. So actually there is no talent. There is hard work and hard work. This is what I will, uh, I will repeat it constantly, because I really believe it. I mean, look any of the top players in the world. Ask them how many hours they have worked in their life and how good they work. I mean, because everything is about choices. A good player cannot, maybe cannot become a good one because he chose the wrong trainer, maybe he chose the wrong place, maybe he chose the wrong tournament. This is a kind of talent, if you want to call it, to choose the right things in the right moment. But that has nothing to do with chess education. Okay. What is next in your career? What are your aspirations as a player, as a trainer, as an organizer? Um, what, what's next? As a player, I have uh, give, uh, give up for professional chess some years now. I'm not playing anymore. Uh, I'm working uh, as a trainer. I'm uh, now nowadays uh, I'm uh, the head trainer of the men of the Turkish men national team, and I'm also creating training programs for uh, FIDE, the International Chess Federation. Of course, I'm writing books. That's I'm concentrating more on. Uh, what we call it uh, the after world of playing, which is coaching. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, just you know, I just like to ask this question in, in some interviews. Do you have any charity causes you'd like to promote? Anything related to chess or not? Well, uh, 
<laughs> I know that's a, that's a curveball. It's out of left field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's quite difficult to answer to that. Uh, I mean, uh, not really. I, I, I just see it just uh, from a different point of view, from uh, let's see that an amateur uh, see it. And uh, for me, chess is a very, very serious business. Although I would love to, to feel chess a little bit, uh, to take it from the funny point of view. Uh, this is what the only uh, what I missed in chess because uh, I was never uh, able to have really fun because everything for me was very serious when I was playing chess and still it's serious when I train even more serious because now you have uh, you must be really responsible you have other people uh, to help and uh, people that they are trusting you so if you make a mistake for yourself it's okay but if you make a mistake for the other it's even worse. Okay, um, kind of changing topics. How do you feel about cheating in chess? I, I know maybe it's been a little bit blown out of proportion in the last year or two, but um, seeing things kind of happen at the top level kind of shocked me. And so, so what do you think, you know, as far as deterrence go or as punishments go? I mean, what, what, how do you feel about that? Well, first of all, we, we have to be objective. Cheating is not happening only on the top. But in, all, in the top, we, we see it. Cheating is happening much more in the lower level because nobody checks it, actually. So, okay, generally, in every sport, cheating is not a way of doing things. It doesn't really prove you are the best. And what's the point of cheating one or two times uh, and you, get, uh, you beat your teammate or your friend? What's the point? I don't really get it. Okay, in the very top level, there are money in stake. There is fame, there are many other things which uh, are pushing some people to try their luck, let's say, because it is luck if they are being counted or not. But uh, okay, generally nobody can be in, uh, in favor of cheating. This is understandable for everybody. I mean, there is no idea of playing the game anyway. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, what is the best cheater? What is this? It's not a, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, right. Not interesting at all. Well, what do you think about punishments? I mean, I, I've heard people say... Punishments is usually as in all the other sport. I mean, uh, if you take the EIF, uh, then uh, the punishment is around two, three years. Um, in chess, uh, generally, as far as I know from feed uh, views, that they are needing to make it more years or even lifetime, bam, bam. But uh, generally, I would consider each case separately. Okay. Exactly what is the cheating and what makes by cheating? Okay. You know, because it's not easy to be proved. You see, if it is a team, it's much more easier. But here we have one to one. It's very difficult to be proven. We might be very objective. We shouldn't be accused people so easily that they are cheating if we are not hundred percent sure. Okay. Um, all right. So. Who is your favorite player and why? Who, who kind of inspired you to play chess and, and try to work so hard towards becoming a GM? Well, you see, I grew up uh, in uh, the environment of uh, Fischer, Kasparov, Karpov and those uh, legends. But uh, I can say that uh, one of my favorite players was uh, Ulf Anderson. Of course, he is still, I mean, the guy has given up chess. Um, Generally, I don't have a very straight uh, preference for a great players. I like great, all great players and I respect them. From the oldest, I believe one of the really uncrowed kings was Akiba Rubistai, which uh, really offered a lot of things to chess. And uh, if the guy was a little bit more lucky, let's say, in a way of uh, non-chess things, he would easily be a world champion. Okay. He, had, he, was, he was, had the potential of the world champion, so he's a little bit underestimated, but I would suggest that uh, people would uh, love to, to see his games and uh, understand his ideas. It would help a lot uh, to grow up as, as a chess player. Okay. Um, so my last question for you, I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time, I, I know you got some stuff to do. Um, who do you think is going to win the 2012 World Championship match between Gelfand and Anand? Well, I think it's something like... Uh, <laughs> I know it's a tough one. <laughs> for Anand, it's for sure. Uh, also, in a match, you shouldn't, you shouldn't underestimate uh, Boris Gelfand. He's a player that uh, he has proved himself all these years. 
and it showed that he would be he would be very well prepared. So actually, everybody knows that uh, Anad is a better player. Anybody you ask, you will tell you will tell him that Anad will win. But in this way, maybe also in football, in soccer, we shouldn't play. We should say that Brazil is the best, and that's all. But no, they have to prove it. They have to prove it over the board. Okay, Anad is the favorite, the hot favorite. But do not underestimate Gilbert. He didn't came the long way just to lose like uh, so easily. He will fight. He will fight. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Mister. Fight. I believe it. I'm. I'm excited to see it. Um, well, Mr. Stratos, I, I certainly appreciate you taking your time um, to do this interview, and uh, the best of luck to you with, with all your training endeavors, and um, hopefully you'll change your mind and, and come back to the board and start playing soon. No way. I'm going to stop All right. Thank you, sir, and uh, the best of luck to you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Sure thing. Take care. Oh.